Hello everyone, welcome to BIS 103, lecture six. And our topic today will be the TCA cycle, or also called the central wheel of metabolism. And throughout the lecture today, we want to find out why we call it the central wheel, what its purpose is, and how it works. So our learning goals for today, there are a number of them, all really close related to the TCA cycle. So we want to be able to describe the importance of acetyl-CoA as a central metabolite in energy metabolism. Right? Remember, acetyl-CoA was our product of the PDH reaction from lecture five. We then want to be able to explain the process and the importance of decarboxylations in the TCA cycle. So how are we utilizing acetyl-CoA in the cycle? Much like we've done for glycolysis, we want to be able to describe the inputs and outputs of the TCI cycle, especially in the context of generating chemical energy. We want to start looking at copper metallization. So we haven't looked at that yet, where these pathways are actually happening. We want to understand this. And lastly, we want to also be able to explain the biosynthetic role of the TCA cycle outside of just the production of chemical energy. So we have a bit of a job ahead of us, but I hope I can make it worthwhile for everyone. Right, let's start off with just putting us into perspective. Right, we want to look back into our cellular respiration. We had talked already a lot about aerobic glycolysis. We had talked about the glycolytic pathway and its function downstream under aerobic or anaerobic conditions. The TCA cycle really is important here in the context of aerobic glycolysis and cellular respiration that we can divide into three parts. Part one would be glycolysis, our first 10 reactions going to pyruvate, and then the PDH reaction from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. We have covered this already in our previous lectures. Now, acetyl-CoA will go into the TCA cycles. That's our second phase of cellular respiration, where we will break it down to carbon dioxide and release reduced electron carriers in form of NADH and FADH2. So the TA cycle is also called tricarboxylic acid cycle, TCA, and we'll see why that is. Another name is citric acid cycle that you find in some textbook, named after its first major intermediate. And the third name that you sometimes find is the Krebs cycle after Hans Krebs, one of the people who have done major work for the discovery and understanding of this cycle. So we're sort of in the middle of our cellular respiration. The third phase then that we will cover in later lectures will be the electron transfer chain where we're actually using these reduced electron carriers to generate ATP. So what does the TCA cycle do? Just really in broad brush strokes, what we are doing here is we are helping to generate chemical energy by oxidizing acetyl-CoA, our PDH product, that in our case, what we've just discussed so far coming from carbohydrates, but it also can come from lipids and proteins. What we're generating is carbon dioxide and we're generating reduced electron carriers, specifically NADH and FADH2. This is the important first role of the TCA cycle in generating chemical energy. Another important role of the TCA cycle actually also is to generate precursors for other biomolecules, especially amino acids and other metabolites. So the TCA cycle actually has multiple functions. It's really centric within a lot of energy metabolism and other anabolic pathways. So that's why we actually call it also the central wheel of metabolism. If we want to talk about the TCA cycle, the first thing we have to do is talk a little bit about acetyl-CoA, right? Again, our product from the PDH pyruvate dehydrogenase complex reaction, where we had converted pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. And this metabolite is really important and it has certain chemical properties that make it very useful for entering into the TCA cycle. So again, here's your metabolite, acetyl-CoA, I sort of highlighted in colors the two major functional groups here. In black, you see the acyl group, Right, your carbonyl atom with a rest attached to it. And then we have a thioester here, in this case, attached to our coenzyme A. And if you remember, right, a thioester is a high energy compound. So it already gives you some idea of what you might be able to do with this compound, right? 
using hydrolysis, you can release energy to facilitate other reactions. However, another important and somewhat unique property of acetyl-CoA is that it can function in different ways. It can actually function as an electrophile or as a nucleophile. So how does this work? It can actually very easily lose a proton. How does this work? If I just sort of draw it out, if you remember your carbonyl groups, right, we have at this carbon here a partial positive charge, right, which will draw away electrons, in this case here, also from this carbon here. So just here, E minus for electrons. What can happen then is if you draw them away is that you can lose this carbon at the methyl group and you end up here just with a CH2 function right there. And as a result, we actually have surplus, apologies, electrons right here. Okay. So in the upper case, right here, right, we have an electrophile. It can function as electrophile if it loses this proton under cellular conditions. In this case here, it now can act as a nucleophile. So keep this in mind. Acetyl-CoA is not just a high energy compound because of its thyroid ester function. It also can act either as a nucleophile or as an electrophile. So it's a very versatile compound in different metabolic reactions. Another note is that it actually, because of these properties, can also condense with itself. And we'll actually see this later as part of ketogenesis. We won't focus on it now, but just as an aside, this can also, because of these functions, condense two molecules of acetyl-CoA. So how can we apply this to the TCA cycle? Why is this important? So let's jump into the cycle. This is it, eight reactions. Unlike our glycolytic pathway, it is functioning as a cycle, which means that one of the substrates here, oxaloacetate or OAA, is also the product, right? So we're starting right here at one, we're bringing in OAA and through this entire cycle, and we're regenerating OAA, thereby it's functioning as a cycle. What do we want to achieve here? Right, we're bringing in two carbons from acetyl-CoA. Here's our substrate, the second one. Acetyl-CoA is entering the cycle as two carbons. And our job really is to decarboxylate and remove these two carbons in form of carbon dioxide here in reactions three and four. This means we are trapping the energy that is in acetyl-CoA in some other form. Right? If you remember our first lectures when we talked about reduced versus oxidized functional groups, right? we had said the most oxidized form, thereby the form with the least energy is carbon dioxide. So at this stage, we are simply squeezing out every last bit of energy that we can out of acetyl-CoA by converting it, its carbon atoms fully into carbon dioxide. What we get out of it is reducing um, electron carriers, right? And there are several of those. We actually have here one, two, and one over here, three molecules of NADH that are generated in this process, one molecule of FADH2, and there's actually one reaction here that is producing GTP, which is just an equivalent of ATP. Just this specific reaction is not producing ATP, it's producing GTP contains the same level of phosphor and hydride bonds, so, so the energy in GTP and ATP is the same. So let's start with the first reaction of the TCA cycle that we have a bit of an understanding of what we want to achieve here. And so this is the first reaction, just zoomed into it now. Right again, here you have your acetyl-CoA coming in as your substrate from the PDH reaction. You have a second substrate coming in, oxaloacetate or OAA. And so in this particular case here, if I go back to my pen, this actually here functions now as a nucleophile in this case. So acetyl-CoA is coming in as a nucleophile in this case. And this is important because if you look at our OAA, right, we have a carbonyl group right here. 
And so this carbon actually has a partial positive charge. It acts as an electrophile. So you can undergo condensation in this case, and that's exactly what is happening here. We are condensing the two molecules together. And so here in these brackets, this is simply an enzyme bound intermediate that we're seeing here, undergoing a condensation of an electrophile and a nucleophile. The second step of this reaction is that we're using water through hydrolysis to cleave off the CoA functional group. What we end up with is citrate right here. The enzyme is called accordingly citrate synthase, and that's one you should be remembering. So what we have achieved here now is that we condense these two molecules. We have removed the CoA cofactor. This is now released. It can go into other reactions. For example, it can be reused in our PDH reaction. What we generated is a carboxylic acid, and a carboxylic acid actually that has three carboxy functions, right? Each of these carbons here is carrying a carboxy function, so it's a tricarboxy acid. That's why the cycle is called TCA or tricarboxy acid cycle. So this is your first key intermediate of what's happening. So first important step here, condensation of acetyl-CoA with OAA. Next up, what is happening next in our reaction two here, highlighted in the red box here, is an isomerization. So what we are doing here is we are converting citrate into isocitrate. How does this work? Just again, just zoomed into the second reaction here. What we're wanting to achieve is that we want to move this hydroxy group here from the middle carbon to the terminal carbon. And much like we'd seen before for isomerizations, the reason is not immediately clear. It's not releasing energy, but it will become apparent just in the later reactions why moving this hydroxy group to the terminal carbon atom here is so important. The enzyme is called an aconitase. You do not need to know the exact um, name. It's a bit of a special isomerase here because it's actually using water to achieve the isomerization, the transfer from the hydroxy group from one to the other carbon. So what is happening is that first we're actually dehydrating, the hydroxy group actually leaves through this enzyme bound intermediate here. You do not have to remember the structure or recognize it. And we're bringing it back in through hydration here. Right? So if you want to remember that this is an aconitase that is using dehydration and rehydration, by cleaving off and then reattaching the hydroxy group to transfer it from one to the other carbon, that's perfectly fine. So keep this in mind now that we have moved this hydroxy group because it will become important. So back to our overview, the next reaction here, this is a really critical one. We are moving from isocitrate and we are converting it into alpha ketoglutarate. If you look at the error here, right, it's an irreversible reaction. What we're doing is we're doing our first decarboxylation and we're also doing an oxidation, which we can tell from the cofactor here, right, that NAD plus is being reduced to NADH. So there must also be an oxidation reduction reaction involved here. Let's look at how this works in more detail. And before we do that, we have to remember our rules of decarboxylation. We talked about this last lecture on what can we, what molecules can we decarboxylate? What properties do we need to have? I know we had said we had these three types of molecules, beta keto acids, alpha hydroxy acids, and alpha keto acids. These can be decarboxylated. How do we define this? Right, it had to do with the position of the hydroxy groups. Just going back to my pen here. And we had said we have the alpha and the beta ones here. And we had said beta keto acids, right? We have a keto function here at the beta position to this carboxy group. These can be decarboxylated. An additional molecule that can be decarboxylated, we said are beta hydroxy acids. 
not outright because they don't have a keto function, but if you have a hydroxy function that is beta to the carboxy group, this can be oxidized to a beta keto acid and can be decarboxylated. The third group was our alpha keto acids. But again, we have our carboxy group here that we want to decarboxylate. Now, we don't want anything at the beta, but we have a keto function here at the alpha position. This also can be decarboxylated, but keep in mind, right? To do so, we need our TPP cofactor. So these are our rules. We need to understand our alpha and beta carbons and whether or not they contain hydroxy or keto functions. So let's apply this to our TCI cycle and the formation of alpha ketoglutarate. Here's your isocitrate. And so you can walk through this molecule and look at, do we have any of the three types of molecules? It's gone a bit more complicated here because we don't only have one carboxy group, right? We have three. And actually you have to keep in mind here that the carboxy group for this rule to apply does not have to be the terminal one. In order to decarboxylate any of these carboxy groups here, it can be any of these. So it just is the relative alpha and beta position to any of these carboxy groups can make it one of these three acids that can be decarboxylated. Right? So if you look at isocitrate, right, we have at the first carbon here, no hydroxy or keto function. We don't have one here but we do have a hydroxy group right here. Okay. So no keto function in this molecule, but a hydroxy function. Now is this hydroxy function beta to any of the carboxy groups, right? So you, now we're going from the different carboxy groups. So if we go to this one here, this is your alpha carbon, it would be an alpha hydroxy. That's not one of our three compounds. But if we move here to this functional group, right, then this would be your alpha, this would be your beta carbon, now you have a beta hydroxy acid, right. This we just learned and remembered, right, we can decarboxylate, so that's great. But we also said, right, we have to oxidize this first to a beta keto acid for the decarboxylation to occur, and this is exactly what's happening here. Just to highlight this with an enzyme-bound intermediate now, you have now, you do your oxidation first, you're using NAD as a cofactor that is being reduced, you're oxidizing the hydroxy group here, you have generated a beta keto acid, and now you can decarboxylate the carboxy group at this carbon here, you generate alpha keto glutarate, or alpha KG for short, so accomplished. So go back to this and sort of practice this for yourself to understand, do I find these different chemical properties that allow us to decarboxylate and which carboxy group can I decarboxylate in this case. Okay. Next up, we just made alpha ketoglutarate. Right, right here, this was your product from the reaction we just looked at. If we go back now to this, Again, we can apply the same rules. Can this be decarboxylated? And now we have two carboxy groups left. This one up here, right? If you look up here, there's no keto or hydroxy function and either the alpha or the beta carbon relative to this carboxy group. If you look at this carboxy group down here, yes, right? We have a carbonyl group here. It's a keto function at the alpha position. It's an alpha keto acid to decarboxylate alpha keto acids. We need TPP as our cofactor right here, right? And now if you look at our product, it's actually succinyl CoA. So CoA indicates we also want to attach this. So we need more cofactors, right? This is actually equivalent to our PDH reaction. It's the exact same mechanism. It just happens to be a dehydrogenase here that doesn't convert pyruvate, it converts alpha KG or alpha ketoglutarate. Meaning we need all five of our cofactors, not just TPP, we need lipoamide, FAD, and we need NAD right, to do this. And then it's the exact same mechanism as we discussed in lecture five to generate succinyl-CoA. 
So now you have achieved you, both of your decarboxylations from acetyl-CoA having entered the TCA cycle. So that's great. What is happening next? And like PDH, remember that. What you've generated now is a thioester, right? Right here, your carbonyl group to the sulfur group to the CoA, that's a thioester. Remember, that's a high energy compound. So we may have an idea what we could do with it, right? We can actually, for example, generate ATP, or in this case, GTP, right? One of our triphosphates using this high energy compound. And how does this work? It's actually a pretty ingenious mechanism. What we're doing is we're actually generating an even higher energy compound. But right? here we have our thioester down here. And what the enzyme actually does here is it's generating a different kind of compound. If you look at it, right, it's got a phosphoryl group. So we had a few high energy compounds that included phosphoryl group. Our thioester, we had seen this right here already. The other one was a phosphoanhydride that requires at least two phosphoryl groups. We only have one here, so that's not it. It's also not a thioester. There's no sulfuryl that leaves either an enolic phosphate or an acyl phosphate. It cannot be an enolic phosphate because we don't have an alkene function here, but we do have a carbonyl function. We do have an acyl side group. So this is an acyl phosphate, one of our high energy compounds. And breaking this down by cleaving it off, the energy can actually be used. We can re remove CoA. We can use the phosphate hydrolysis to transfer it over to GDP, we can generate GTP. And our other product here, you see right here coming in, right, that is succinate. So not succinate CoA anymore, we have made succinate. And what I want to highlight here is that this is a completely symmetrical metabolite. Right? We'll get back to why that's important later. All right, that's great. We have produced GTP. And now the rest of the cycle, its sole purpose actually is to regenerate OAA. Right? Remember, we are operating here as a cycle. And in doing so, we actually only need what we call catalytic amounts of OAA to run this cycle. Right? Because all the next steps are helping to regenerate OAA, Theoretically, you only ever need one molecule of OAA and you can take on one acetyl-CoA after the other and you can run this cycle. That's what we call catalytic amounts. And you can see how this is really energy efficient to do these recycling reactions. Otherwise, you would always have to generate a new molecule of OAA from other resources to run this cycle. We don't have to do this here because we recycle it from the internal intermediates of the cycle. How do we do this? Right? If you look at the comparison of OAA here to our succinate, right, you can see that here we have a carbonyl group. Here's just a methylene group. So you can imagine what we'll have to do is, is an oxidation. We have to get oxygen in there somehow. The way we achieve it is the first reaction let me just go back here. In the first reaction, we do an oxidation of this carbon-carbon bond here. We're using here as a cofactor FAD, reducing it to FADH2. Now we have this double bond oxidase. These double bonds are more reactive than the single bonds. What this allows us to do now is actually to bring in water across this double bond that allows us to hydroxylate we're generating malate. And now if you look at the product we want to generate, it's a carbonyl group. We have a hydroxy group here. This is a simple oxidation step. In this case, we're using NAD, reducing it to NADH. We have regenerated OAA that can now be used again as another substrate for another round of the TCA cycle. Fantastic. All right. So the way people have figured this out, and I just want to highlight a bit of an example here, is to use radio-labeled substrate and then feed these into cell suspensions of cell cultures that are actively doing the TCA. 
So what people would do is they would radio label the carbons of acetyl-CoA and feed it in and then analyze the radioactivity in all the different intermediates that are coming out from the TCA cycle. Okay? So I have highlighted here in red where the carbons of acetyl-CoA actually are going. And so this highlights your first turn of the TCA cycle. Right? So here are your radio labeled carbons, you're undergoing this condensation and they're up here, you're moving through all the intermediates now, isocitrate, alpha ketoglutarate, and so forth, are containing the radio label of acetyl-CoA. Right? Note that none of these in this first turn of the cycle have ended up in radio labeled carbon dioxide. So this knowledge can now be used to understand where in the molecule are these carbons and which of these carboxy groups are decarboxylated first. Right? So this has really helped to understand the mechanisms of these two decarboxylations by simply looking at which molecules are carrying the radio label from the substrate of acetyl -CoA. Now it becomes complicated in our succinate molecule here because we have an even distribution of the radio label across all the carbons because it's a symmetrical metabolite. The enzyme can actually not distinguish which side is up and down. So you find a 50 to 50 ratio of the radio label in this molecule. Now what happens in your second turn of the cycle? I highlight this in blue, right? So you ran the cycle once, now you're bringing in a second molecule of acetyl-CoA, again, radio labeled. What is happening now is for the um, new acetyl-CoA that has come in, the same happens as we've seen in the first turn, right? It sort of stays within these metabolites, but now in the second turn here in red, these are still the carbons from the first molecule of acetyl-CoA that we fed in in the first turn, so that had come from the OAA that had been recycled, okay? And so now we're running through here, and we're seeing now the radio label actually ends up in our carbon dioxide. Okay. So these types of studies can really be used to understand the reaction mechanisms of multi-reaction pathways. Okay. In your study aids, I have a few examples and test questions, and you can sort of use these to understand for yourself and work these problems for yourself on how radio labeling can be used to track the fate of different carbons throughout a multi-reaction pathway. And we can obviously also cover those in the office hours throughout the quarter. All right, so now that we have understand all of the eight reactions of this cycle, we want to summarize right, what have we accomplished? What have we done? Right. And I already mentioned this before, if we put them all together with the ETC, we're actually getting two and a half ATP out of NADH and a little bit less, one and a half ATP out of FADH2. I'll explain later when we talk about the ETC, how this works and why it is. Of course, keep in mind, we're not actually making half a molecule of ATP. This is just in terms of these reactions of recycling NADH and FADH2 in the ETC, releasing enough energy to make one and a half and two and a half ATP respectively. Okay. So those numbers, taking those numbers into account, what did we get out of acetyl-CoA? Right? We made three NADH for a total of seven and a half ATP. We made one FDH2 for a total of one and a half ATP. And remember, we made one GTP, which is equivalent to one ATP. So the total for us from one molecule of acetyl-CoA is 10 ATP that we made. Okay. Now, if we add from pyruvate, right, our pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, also there we released one NADH, so another two and a half ATP. So taking these two together, we now have made 12 and a half ATP. Going now all the way back to glucose, right? If we double this up, remember, right, we had generated two pyruvates. So both these reactions are happening twice. So we double our 12 and a half to 25 ATP. In addition, in glycolysis, right, we had a net ATP yield of two ATP. And in the glycolytic pathway, we also released, right, two NADH from our reaction six there. 
So another five ATP. So we're making actually a total from one molecule of glucose of 32 ATP using cellular respiration. And now if you compare this to our lecture of fermentation where we said our total net yield per glucose actually is only two ATP. So this is really the power of aerobes. Using oxygen actually allows you to make 16 times more ATP out of every glucose molecule. So it's a super efficient pathway for energy production. Now that we know how much we are making, we want to also understand where is all of this actually happening. Right? We have discussed these pathways so far basically in isolation. We haven't really talked about where in the cell is this actually occurring. Right? And so we want to compare how this is happening in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Right? In prokaryotes, it's very simple. They are lacking the organelles. So here you actually have glycolysis and the TCA cycle occurring in the cytoplasm inside the cell. And the ETC is actually a membrane bound mechanism and pathway, we will see this, is actually sitting here in the inner membrane, but has access to the products of glycolysis right here, right at the membrane. So it's facing to the inside, but some of the enzymes are actually located within the uh, membrane. How does this compare to eukaryotes? Very different because right, we are making use of our organelles. So again, our glucose is actually sitting here in the cytosol. And remember right, our discussion on glycogen that is sort of sitting there as really big granules of sugar polymers. Glycolysis is also happening in the cytosol. So it has direct access to the glucose. But then our PDH reaction and the TCA they're actually occurring in the mitochondria. Right. So right here, and then if you zoom in, also our ETC is actually happening at the inner membrane of the mitochondria here. So what you're seeing here is the inner membrane that is sort of formed in these invaginations here. What they are doing is they're increasing the available surface, the membrane surface, and that allows you to actually place a whole lot of ETC enzymes in this membrane here. So you can increase your capacity for this pathway. Right? Keep in mind, we don't only have one copy of each of these enzymes for these pathways that we're discussing. We have lots of those in the cell. All right, so this covers what we wanted to discuss about how we can use the TCA cycle for energy metabolism by generating electron carriers that can later be used in the ETC to generate ATP. But I also told you right, the TCA cycle can also be used for other purposes. One is that it actually can not only take up acetyl-CoA from sugars, it can also take it up from the breakdown of amino acids and fatty acids. How this works, we will say in the upcoming lectures. And in addition to that, and have, it has a biosynthetic function. So it can actually also generate biosynthetic precursors for a number of essential molecules, including amino acids such as glutamine here or nucleotides. Right? But keep in mind, if this is occurring, then it's not functioning as a cycle. Okay? But because of, these, of this dual functionality, the TCA cycle is actually a fantastic example of an amphibolic pathway. So a pathway that is both anabolic and catabolic, right? it can help in energy production using catabolism, so breaking down acetyl-CoA for carbon dioxide, or it can function as an anabolic pathway and produce a variety of different biosynthetic precursors. So if you want to do this, how does this work? So here again, I show you the TCA cycle. I just took out all the confusing structures and just left the um, intermediate names in there. Uh, just to orient yourself up here, right, is our pyruvate and the PDH reaction coming into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is then condensed with OAA to citrate, and we're running through this entire cycle. That was what we discussed so far if you want to do energy production, right? But we can also, indicated here in green, siphon off different intermediates to generate a whole bunch of other biomolecules. So for example, citrate can actually, through a different pathway, 
be used as citric acid and can be stored, or it can actually go into the cytosol and can be used for the production of, for example, fatty acids. Alpha-KG is a major precursor for a lot of amino acids that are really critical for protein biosynthesis. Succinyl-CoA can be siphoned off to make porphyrins and things like vitamins, chlorophyll that happens in plants and other autotrophic organisms, or for the production of hemes. These are also cofactors that we haven't touched on yet. They're absolutely critical for survival. And then OAA in itself can also be used, for example, for the production of aspartate. And aspartate in turn is critical for producing a whole number of different amino acids, as well as nucleotide bases. Okay? So in addition to energy, the TCA cycle actually delivers a number of key intermediates for these different biosynthetic pathways. What is important to keep in mind now is, all right, if you do this, if you take any of these intermediates out, you cannot run it as a cycle anymore. Right? So for example, right, if you take out alpha-KG to make different amino acids, alpha-KG cannot be further converted. You cannot regenerate OAA. It functions now as a linear pathway, not as a cycle anymore. Right? Of course, then right, you run out of OAA to run your um, dependent cycle for energy production. So you have to bring it in from other resources. So you have to make OAA by different means. And that's what we mean by we need stoichiometric amounts of OAA, meaning you have to bring in as many molecules of OAA or any other metabolite you have taken out of the pathway as you have taken out, right? If you take out one alpha KG, you have to bring in one OAA or one alpha KG. If you've taken out two, you have to bring in two to maintain the stoichiometry of the pathway. So this is it. This is TCA cycle. I hope you enjoyed it. It's one of the sort of really key, fascinating pathways in our metabolism. And we'll move on in the next lectures trying to understand how we can further use it for energy production as well as how we can deal with some of these site biosynthetic reactions.